Psycho-Cybernetics, written by Maxwell Maltz. Chapter 3, Imagination, the first key to your success mechanism. The secret of hypnotic power. Dr. Theodore Xenophon Barber has conducted extensive research into the phenomena of hypnosis, both when he was associated with the psychology department of American University in Washington, D.C., and also after he became becoming associated with the Laboratory of Social Relations at Harvard. Writing in Science Digest recently, he said, We found that hypnotic subjects are able to do surprising things only when convinced that the hypnotist's words are true statements. When the hypnotist has guided the subject to the point where he is convinced that the hypnotist's words are true statements, the subject then behaves differently because he thinks and believes differently. The phenomena of hypnosis has always seemed mysterious because it has always been difficult to understand how belief can bring about such unusual behavior. It always seemed as if there must be something more, something unfathomable, some unfathomable force or power at work. However, the plain truth is, when a subject is convinced he is deaf, he, he behaves as if he is deaf. When he is convinced that he is insensitive to pain, he can undergo surgery without anesthesia. The mysterious force or power does not exist. Could you be hypnotized? Science Digest, January 1958. A little reflection will show why it is a good thing for us to. For a little reflection will show why it is a very good thing for us that we do feel and act according to what we believe or imagine to be true. Truth determines action and behavior. The human brain and nervous system are engineered to react automatically and appropriately to the problems and challenges in the environment. For example. A man does not need to think or think or stop and think that self-survival requires that he run if he meets a grizzly bear on a trail. He does not need to decide to become afraid. Their fear response is both automatic and appropriate. First, it makes him want to flee. The fear then triggers bodily mechanisms which soup up his muscles so that he can run faster than he has ever run before. His heartbeat is quickened. Adrenaline, a powerful muscle stimulant, is poured into the bloodstream. All bodily functions, not necessary to running, are shut down. The stomach stops working, and all available blood is sent to the muscles. Breathing is much faster, and the oxygen supplied to the muscles is increased manifold. All this, of course, is nothing new. Most of us have learned it in high school. What we have not been so quick to realize, however, is that the brain and nervous system which reacts automatically to the environment is the same brain and nervous system which tells us what the environment is. The reactions of the man meeting the bear are commonly thought of as due to emotion rather than to ideas. Yet it was an idea, information received from the outside world and evaluated by the forebrain, which sparked the so-called emotional reactions. Thus it was basically idea or belief which was the true causative agent rather than emotion which came as a result. In short, the man on the trail reacted to what he thought or believed or imagined the environment to be. The messages brought to us from the environment consist of nerve impulses from the various sense organs. These nerve impulses are decoded, interpreted, and evaluated in the brain and made known to us in the form of ideas or mental images. In the final analysis, it is these mental images that we react to. You act and feel not according to what things are really like, but according to the image your mind holds of what they are like. You have certain mental images of yourself, your world, and the world, and the people around you. And you behave as if, as though these things were Im these images were the truth, the reality, rather than the things that they represent. Let us suppose, for example, that the man on the trail had not met a real bear, but a movie actor dressed in a bear costume. If he thought and imagined the actor to be a bear, his emotional and nervous reactions would have been exactly the same. Or let us suppose he met a large, shaggy dog, which his fear-ridden imagination mistook for a bear. Again, he would react automatically to what he believed to be true concerning himself and his environment. It follows that if our ideas and mental images concerning ourselves are distorted or unrealistic, then our reaction to our environment will likewise, likewise be inappropriate.